Room. Let's start by taking a look at the day's headlines. One seat for the Liberals and one for the Conservatives. In Wednesday's by-elections in South Korea, the results suggest the main opposition party might have the momentum going into the 2020 general elections. The future is now. South Korea becomes the first country in the world to launch commercial fifth generation or 5G services. Plus, U.S. officials are again signalling that their trade talks with China are drawing closer to ending their months-long trade spat that's rocked the global economy. So let's start with the results from Wednesday's parliamentary by-elections here in South Korea. The results are out. One National Assembly seat went to the main opposition Liberty Korea Party and the other to the minor uh, opposition Justice Party. Our political correspondent Kim Min Ji starts us off. It was a draw between the Conservatives and the Liberals at the parliamentary by elections. The district of Changwon Songsan in Gyeongsangnam-do province went to Yeo Young Guk of the minor progressive Justice Party. He garnered 45.75 percent of the votes in a tight race, aided by the candidacy merge with the ruling Democratic Party. The constituency of Tongyang Kozang in the same province went to the main opposition Liberty Korea Party's Chang Jam Sik, who won by a huge margin. Although it was only two seats, the by elections gave a read on public sentiment in the traditional conservative province ahead of next year's general elections. The Liberty Korea Party fared relatively well, despite being marred in controversy for inappropriate campaigning and bribery allegations surrounding one of its candidates. Although it wasn't able to overcome the single candidacy factor in Changwon Songsan, the party lost out by less than one percentage point in the region that has long been a liberal stronghold. And in Tongyang Kosong, the party won in a landslide, reaffirming the conservative strong grip on the district. The results have cemented the standing of the party's leadership, and it's also a sign that the party may have brushed off its tainted image due to its ties to oust of former President Park Geun-hye. I believe the results are a judgment of how people feel about the government. They have given our party the task of reviving the economy. It's a blow to the ruling Democratic Party that couldn't add any extra parliamentary seats. The approval rating for the Moon Jae administration and the party has dwindled, mostly due to the slowing economy and stalled denuclearization talks with North Korea. Another downside was the presidential office's string of controversial nominations for cabinet posts. We will step up cooperation with minor parties and fight against the Liberty Korea Party and crush them in next year's general elections. As for the Justice Party, now with an extra seat can launch a negotiating block with the minor party for democracy and peace, as they will have 20 lawmakers combined, which is the minimum threshold. If so, it would give them a greater say in legislative affairs and create a four-party system in the National Assembly. With neither bloc securing a full win, it remains to be seen how the parties reshape themselves before the April 2020 general elections. For now, the winners will have to work extra hard to meet expectations and solidify their support base, while the losers will have to identify their shortcomings and foster support before the entire nation heads to the polls in 12 months' time. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now, the National Assembly's House Steering Committee is set to be briefed by officials from the presidential office. President Moon's chief of staff, No Young Min, as well as other top aides, will be in attendance. Front and centre is likely to be the string of controversial nominations for cabinet posts. The opposition bloc will likely slam the top office for what it claims was poor vetting of the candidates and demand those responsible step down. President Moon's picks for transport and science minister fell through last week over ethical lapses. Conservatives are also demanding the president withdraw nominations for his picks for SME and unification ministers. The meeting is garnering extra attention given that the ruling party didn't fare particularly, particularly well in Wednesday's by-elections. Now, South Korea is celebrating the world's first launch of commercial 
fifth generation or 5G services, with the country's major mobile uh, carriers opening their services to their VVIP customers first. Uh, Kim Hyo-sun tells us more. South Korean mobile carriers commercially launched 5G services at 11 p.m. on Wednesday. The nation's three major mobile carriers, SK Telecom, KT and LG U+, celebrated the world's first launch of a consumer 5G network. South Korea was also the first country to launch a 5G network for corporate use in December last year. The nation's top mobile carrier, SK Telecom, provided 5G services to its honorary ambassadors, K-pop boy band EXO, former Olympic figure skating champion Kim hyun professional gamer Lee Sang-hyuk, para swimmer Yoon Sung-hyuk, and his loyal customer Park Jae-won, who has been a subscriber to the carrier for 31 years. We are introducing 5G infrastructure, VR and AR, but future services will be far better than the current VR and AR. KT and LG U Plus also began 5G services, with the latter celebrated the inauguration of its services with a power blogger. KT aims to introduce a cheaper 5G data plan compared to its current LTE plan. We will provide unlimited data services with an unlimited data roaming package when traveling overseas. While South Korea originally planned to introduce the services on Friday, the date was brought forward amid speculation U.S. mobile carrier Verizon may begin its 5G services on Thursday. Beginning Friday, the public can subscribe to the 5G network, which offers 20 times faster data speeds than 4G long-term evolution networks. The Korea 5G Day, an event co-organized by the public and private sectors, will be held on April 8th to celebrate the world's first launch of the 5G network. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. South Korea's goods account marked its lowest surplus in more than four years in February. The Bank of Korea says the goods account, which records the country's goods transactions with the world, had a surplus of around five and a half billion U.S. dollars, down from 5.7 billion the previous month. That's the smallest surplus since July 2014. The central bank said exports dropped more than 10 percent on year, mainly due to a fall in semi conductor exports. Korea's current account was in surplus for the 82nd month in a row in February. South Korea and the United States have affirmed their confidence in keeping troop readiness at an appropriate level after the shake-up of their joint military exercises. This is according to the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Joseph Dunford on Tuesday at a ceremony where he gave the Legion of Merit to South Korea's Defence Minister, Jong gyeong Du, Dunford added the Allies are also comfortable with the drills they have scheduled for the coming months as well. Last month, South Korea and the U.S. completed the new exercise. It's called 19-1 Dongmeng as a replacement for the key resolve exercise. They're expected to conduct 19-2 in the fall. Now, South Korea is planning to build hiking trails leading up the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, and allow civilian access to them. Kan hyung reports. South Korea is opening up three hiking trails leading up to the DMZ to allow civilian access to the area for the first time since the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement in 1953. The government will do all it can to transform the DMZ, a scar from the world that separated the two Koreas, into the front line of peace and prosperity. We will eventually make it a symbolic place for world peace and nature. Tentatively called the DMZ Peace Trails, they involve the three South Korean border towns of Paju, Cheolwon, and Gosong, one each in the west, the center, and the east. In late April, the government first plans to start a pilot program at the Gosong Trail, where visitors will be able to go either on foot or via vehicle and get as close as possible to the DMZ. The opening dates for the Paju and Choron trails have not been set. Some are concerned about safety since the trails go through certain areas where the military is active. But civilians will be escorted by heavily armed soldiers and will carry bulletproof vests and helmets. Seoul's Defense Ministry is in discussions with UN Command to get approval for civilians to go into the DMZ and to ensure their safety.
for the Peace Trail Project, the Unification Ministry's Inter-Korean Exchange and Cooperation Council has approved 3.9 million U.S. dollars. Those hoping to walk along the Kosong Trail can apply for a lottery on the websites of the Ministry of the Interior and Safety and the Korea Tourism Organization starting April 11th. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. The United States and China are negotiating a way to end their trade spat. This round of talks is taking place in Washington following their two-day talks in Beijing last week. For more on this and other news from around the world, today we're going to turn to our Cha Sang-mi. Uh, so Sang-mi, we hear that they might be, anyway, closing in on an agreement. Right, Mark. The United States and China kicked off a fresh round of negotiations in Washington on Wednesday local time amid hopes they can finally hammer out a comprehensive agreement to put an end to their trade war. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer is hosting Chinese Vice Premier Liu Ha in Washington. The negotiation comes after the two sides resumed talks four months ago. In the last week's two-day talks in Beijing, when Liu hosted Lighthizer and U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow on Wednesday said the trade negotiations between the two economic powerhouses are progressing and they hope to get closer to a deal this week. Kudlow added they made good headway in Beijing last week where China acknowledged problems of intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer and hacking for the first time as a result of the talks. If the talks are successful, Presidents Trump and Xi may get together to sign a final agreement to send their protracted um, to, to uh, finally to send their protracted to end their tariff dispute. The head of the NATO has stressed that his uh, allies uh, must. The head of the NATO has stressed that its allies must spend more on defense to overcome internal conflicts and face the threat posed by, quote, a more, uh, a more assertive Russia. Addressing U.S. Congress on Wednesday, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg explained NATO's allies will be spending more on defense, which will be used to invest in new military capabilities, including state-of-the-art fighter jets and drones. He added his remark reiterates a clear message sent by President Trump, who called on Washington's allies to sharply boost their NATO-related defense budgets. Stoltenberg also urged Russia to return to the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Brunei is enacting strict new Islamic laws that say gay sex and adultery is punishable by stoning to death. The move comes despite intense opposition from the international community, including the UN, that continues to urge the Southeast Asian nation not to apply the controversial penalty. Lee seung reports. Despite heavy opposition from the international community, including celebrities like George Clooney and Elton John, Brunei is enacting strict new Islamic laws that make gay sex and adultery punishable by stoning to death. The new penal code was implemented by the Sultan of Brunei, Hassan al-Bolkai, who also acts as the country's prime minister. Under stages two and three of the latest penal code, sex between two men and adultery will carry a punishment of stoning to death, while sex between two women is punishable with hundred lashes. The UN's human rights body is calling the enactment a real setback and a move that seriously breaches international human rights law. And the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, said today, urged today the government of Brunei to stop entry into force of a new penal code which would enshrine in legislation cruel and un inhumane punishment in breach of international human rights law, including death by stoning. If this law is actually enforced, um, it will be a real setback uh, for the human rights of the people of Brunei. Um, and we're talking about a country which has maintained a moratorium on the death penalty since 1957. In 2014, Brunei became the first Southeast Asian nation to introduce Sharia law at a national level. Along with the latest law on gay sex and adultery, the law also introduces other harsh penalties such as amputation of limbs for stealing and imprisonment for dressing as a different gender. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. 
A flawless 88-carat oval diamond was sold to a private Japanese collector for nearly 14 million U.S. dollars at Sotheby's Hong Kong sale of magnificent jewels and jadeite. The walnut-sized diamond is said to be D-color, meaning the whitest for colorless diamonds, and flawless, referring to no inclusion inside or on the surface. And the bidding battle was done and dusted in under 10 minutes. Three clients competed for the lucky stone and a Japanese buyer on the bid to name it after his oldest daughter, Manami Star. The gem is one of just three oval diamonds over 50 carats to have appeared at auctions in recent memory. Thank you to our Sangmi for the world news there. Now it's time for our life and info segment where we focus on information useful for your everyday life, whether you're in Korea or somewhere else around the world, perhaps thinking of uh, taking a vacation here. Today we're going to turn our focus to Korean culture and uh, to give us some cultural updates on all the events happening in South Korea right now. We have our Lee min Sun in the studio uh, with us. min Sun, your first time uh, in the studio with me at least and uh, welcome. It is spring more or less now. We are in April. The weather is starting to warm up. Uh, tell us some of the nice places out there we can go to enjoy this spring season. Yeah, hi Mark. So around this time of the year, major royal palaces in Seoul um, hold special events and open up some spaces that are usually not open to public. Yeah, well, it really is a good opportunity to check out the royal palaces at this time of the year. You can uh, really get a taste for Korea's culture while you're there. And it's a good place to spend the day or, or even night, because we're going to talk about the night programs shortly, I believe. Um, regardless of whether you've lived here for years or you're a Korean uh, or if you're just a tourist as well, there's a little bit of everything for everyone. Right. So I went to Gyeongbokgung Palace last night, which is the main palace located in the heart of Seoul, um, to attend a special night program. So this last night's um, program was a preview to Royal Culture Festival, which will start on April 26th. So this nine-day festival will offer some 40 programs and at five royal palaces and Jongmyo Shrine. So this year, the festival added one more palace, Gyeonggi-gung, to offer more family-oriented programs. So the preview of the festival presented um, seven selected programs in an immersive theater format. So actors and actresses played roles such as the king, queen, ministers, scholars, and court ladies, and gave a guided tour for participants. And about 150 people were invited to the event, and they walked along with the actors to visit major places and buildings of Gyeongbokgung Palace. The Royal Culture Festival opens up palaces that contain 500 years of Joseon Dynasty history. This year, we are opening more palaces and have unique programs for visitors, like hands-on experiences. Wonderful moments await if you join the festival. I am playing a minister, but rather than showing dignity, my role is to communicate with visitors and explain in a fun way what these buildings were used for in the past. Instead of thinking that a palace is boring, I hope people come and have some fun. Min Sun then, so describe to us what this festival is actually like and what are some of the other events that people can enjoy if they go. So participants don't just stand and watch, but they interact with the actors to take part in some programs. And at the Gunjangjeon Hall, visitors take a seat and pretend that they are taking an exam, which um, scholars from the old days had to pass to become government officials. Um, of course, and performances and music are a key part of the festival. There was a royal guard inspection and practice, which involved some action and martial arts. And the highlight for me and many others was the music performance held at the Gyeonghwaeru Pavilion, where the singer sang while gliding through across the pond in a boat, just before a dragon appears. And let's hear from the visitors that were at the festival. It's not easy to get into Gyeongbokgung Palace at night. I came because I wanted to see it while it was dark, but it's so beautiful and it's beyond my imagination. 
I found out about the Royal Culture Festival this year. I was excited to see and experience what programmes are lined up. I really enjoyed the Royal Guard inspection and the dragon appearing at the Gyeongeru Pavilion performance. On top of the programmes presented at the preview night, there are many more for people to choose from, such as a mask dance, a night tour of a Royal, um, royal Garden, and a musical performance. And there's even an augmented reality programme to find a hidden treasure at Changdeokgung Palace. And those who want to participate should buy a ticket to enter the palace, but if you are wearing hanbok, you can get free admission. Okay. And most programs are available to join on the spot, but some programs need pre-registration. So make sure to check the details on the website before you head to the festival as it's proving very popular. So if you wear a hanbok, you can get in for free, but if you don't, you have to pay. Right. And uh, how much is a ticket? Do you uh, it's remember? not um, very expensive. It's uh, ranging from 1,000 to 3,000, which is about uh, less than one US dollars to less than three dollars. That's very reasonable uh, indeed then. And uh, presumably kids are even cheaper or free or are kids allowed to go? Uh, kids, I believe it's a little cheaper. OK, great. Well, wonderful. I might want to uh, go and check out this experience myself. Did you personally enjoy it? Yes, it was very fun last night. OK, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your reporting, Min Sun. You would have never guessed it was your first time. Very professional. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do is, before we get to the weather, we're going to give you a brief rundown on some of the other events at uh, Seoul's many royal palaces and also some uh, travel programmes that uh, are taking place outside of Seoul as well. Good morning. Temperatures will rise a couple degrees higher than Wednesday and will hover above the norms by the afternoon, so we will have warm spring temperatures back again. Meanwhile, a dry weather advisory has been expanded to more areas with even warnings in parts of the east and Daegu. And a strong wind advisory is in place for the eastern parts of the country. So, you know, it's a perfect conditions for wildfire there. I mean, just a spark could cause a wildfire, so be extra careful. Speaking of which, a strong wind advisory could be issued in the capital and winds will get stronger tomorrow. We're talking about typhoon force winds, so take that into account. Temperature gaps could be as wide as 10 to 15 degrees, and highs in most areas will be in the upper teens under bright skies along with normal air today. And highs will get up to 16 degrees Celsius here in the capital and over in Chuncheon, Daegu, Gyeongju, getting up to 20 and 22 degrees. Big temperature differences are in the forecast for the time being with on and off sprinkles in central parts of the country tomorrow and Saturday is looking rainy as well. That's Korea for you and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's all we have for now on this Thursday morning here in Seoul. Do stay tuned to us here on Arirang TV. Plenty more coming up. And a reminder that our next newscast is coming up at noon Korea time with our very own E.G. Yoon. So until then, goodbye. Thank you.